Hey everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is a plant-based registered dietitian. She's been on the show before. Her name is Kaylee Anderson, and today she's going to be talking about plant-based eating for pregnancy. Please welcome her back to the show. It's so nice to see you again. You too. Thanks for having me. Of course, boy, I'm sure you get this a lot. You probably get, not that you, I don't know if you drink alcohol, it doesn't matter, but I'm sure you probably get carded because you seem to be, have found the fountain of youth and reversing the aging process. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe you can tell our viewers the secret. <laughs> Plant-based foods, of course. Yeah. I've been doing, doing it for 15 years, so wow. it pays oh, off. It suits you. Thank you. This is something you're very interested in is, is plant-based eating for pregnancy, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So I kind of specialize in women's health. So lots of things with plant-based nutrition and, and women's health, um, which includes pregnancy, of course. And then all of that became quite personal because I'm about eight and a half months pregnant myself right now. So um, I've been practicing everything that we'll talk about today. Wow. Well, congratulations. Do you think that registered dietitians in general specialize in areas usually? Because I, I get so many people asking me uh, if I know a plant-based dietitian, but they'll say, well, that will help with IBS, that will help with cancer, or can any registered dietitian help with different disease processes? Yeah, that's a great question. We are certainly trained in all areas, you know, kind of the general uh, information for all areas. But there's so much to know about food and nutrition and the human body. Um, so sp finding a specialist can be a really helpful thing. So like with women's health, there's lots of things with hormones and different stages of the life cycle that women go through that are different than men. Uh, so it's helpful to find someone who kind of knows the ins and outs of that. That is great. Well, because I, I, I hear that a lot. And is there a list somewhere of plant-based registered dietitians for people that want private consultations? And do you do them? Yeah, so I, I'm not currently taking private consultations with the uh, my little plant-based baby on the way, um, but the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group is a great resource, and I'm happy to share that link. I think it's vndpg.org, uh, and you can find plant-based dietitians there. And then they're, you know, in plantbaseddocs.com and some of the other plant-based databases that have doctors, they also include dietitians and other healthcare professionals as well. Because that is something, if you're, if you're looking for a plant-based, someone who specializes in plant-based nutrition, you certainly want to find a dietitian who knows what they're talking about. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Love to have that resource and I'll put it in the show notes. Perfect. Yeah, I'll share that. Thank you. So what do we, you know, it's funny that you're, you know, I, I've been interviewing, I told you before uh, we, we logged on that I've been interviewing doctors for the, the Truth About Weight Loss Summit that's going to take place next month. And one of the things that a bunch of them have said, especially those that specialize like in addiction and food addiction is that what the mother eats, not only when she's pregnant, but before she's pregnant really has an effect on how the kid's going to turn out. Yep, that's true. It's a pretty crazy thing that we've learned through epigenetics that all of the lifestyle factors, including food, exercise, and any environmental toxins that you're exposed to, even in the time before you become pregnant, can actually impact your baby's health. So um, that's why this topic is really important to kind of know what to do and, and you know how to set not only yourself up for success, but also your baby's health up for success. And we'll talk about that a little bit today too. Great. I can't wait to see your presentation. I love slides because when there's something to look at, I feel I pay better attention. Yes, me too. Very visual. It's very helpful. Yeah. Awesome. Are you ready for me to dive in? Yep. How to have a happy, healthy plant-based pregnancy. All right. Perfect. Well, I'm excited to talk about this topic because it is uh, so important. And as Chef AJ said, this isn't the first time I've gotten to come on and chat with all of you, but if we're meeting for the first time, then it's great to meet you. And as I said, I'm a dietitian that specializes in women's health and plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine. And I've been living a plant-based lifestyle for 15 years now. So it's really become an integrated part of my life. And I live in Colorado. So I like to be really active and um, everything outdoors, skiing, hiking, mountain biking. Um, this is my husband and I running the Big Sur Marathon last spring. 
So I really like to show women that no matter what they want to do in life, a plant-based diet can really help them thrive because I feel like especially with women, you get thrown off, whether you're wanting to lose weight or you're wanting to run a marathon or you're going through pregnancy where you start to question your plant-based choices. Um, and so I really like to show that, you know, no matter what it is that you're doing, you can still be healthy and it might even help you. Uh, and that's really why I created my website, plantbasedmavens.com. It has tons of free information on plant-based nutrition for women's health, how to meet their unique needs at different life stages, um, and really just how to live a healthy life on a plant-based diet. And as I mentioned, you know, pregnancy is no exception. It's an important time. I see a lot of women stop eating plant-based during this time, and that's certainly um, not necessary. And I've worked with a lot of plant-based uh, pregnant people and pregnant people in general who are interested in incorporating more plant-based foods during their pregnancy. And then of course, recently this became all very personal when I became pregnant. So um, all of this has been put into practice. And the question that we so often hear when it comes to plant-based diets and pregnancy is, is it safe? Is it safe to do that? And you might have people questioning whether or not it's safe. Um, well, I can confidently say that yes, it is safe to follow a plant-based diet during pregnancy. And according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uh, statement, which is what we're seeing here, appropriately planned vegetarian and vegan diets are appropriate for all stages of the life cycle, including pregnancy and lactation. And I want to point out that uh, appropriately planned piece, uh, because a lot of people will say, oh, it's harder to follow a plant-based diet during pregnancy, but that's not necessarily true because really all healthy diets need to be well-planned, you know, whether they're for pregnancy or outside of pregnancy or for a certain health condition, um, it takes a little bit of planning. So that's not something that's unique to plant-based diets necessarily. And plant-based diets might offer some really awesome benefits to pregnant people, which is very cool. So they've been connected with reduced risk of pregnancy complications, lower rates of postpartum depression and neonatal mortality. And then kind of what we were talking about earlier with setting your baby up for success, they're actually connected with lower risk of certain pediatric conditions. So your baby may be less likely to have type one diabetes, neural tube defects, and asthma later in their life. And currently, most women enter pregnancy already deficient in a lot of really important nutrients. So um, people who are following kind of conventional diets are not doing that, that great with meeting their pregnancy needs. And because plant-based foods are rich sources of many of these nutrients, they can really help kind of replenish those deficiencies. And we do have information on what pregnant people, kind of the general population um, are eating and where they're not measuring up to certain recommendations. So in general, pregnant people are not getting enough vegetables, fruits, or whole grains. All that can be improved with the plant-based diet. And they're exceeding recommended limits for added sugars by 70%. Saturated fats by 75% and sodium by as much as 88%. Um, so all reasons why we can improve uh, uh, diets for plant-based or for pregnant people. And then this is one of my favorite benefits to talk about. Um, and this again goes back to kind of setting the baby up for success. So baby taste buds actually develop in utero. So whatever mom is eating, baby is actually tasting through amniotic fluid and then later through breast milk. And so there's this really cool study where infants who were exposed to carrot juice through their mom drinking it while she was pregnant with them and then later while breastfeeding actually showed a preference for carrot flavor once they started eating solids compared to babies who were not exposed to the carrot juice. So this prenatal and kind of early postnatal exposure to foods might actually be kind of establishing your baby's palate and helping them enjoy and accept healthy foods um, when they start eating solids. So all to say plant-based diets can offer benefits for both mom and baby, which is pretty cool. So what does a well-planned plant-based diet look like during pregnancy? So this is a graphic that I created to kind of help illustrate this. And I'm sure you've probably seen lots of different plate graphics um, to show what a healthy, healthy diet looks like. 
But there are a few differences from what we might be used to seeing in a general plant-based diet. So I wanna point those out. So first, we're used to seeing half the plate be fruits and vegetables when we're talking about kind of general plant-based nutrition. But here we kind of shifted that to third. So a third is fruits and vegetables, a third is our whole grains and starchy vegetables, and then a third is our beans, peas, soy, nuts, and seeds. And this is really to help meet the increased energy needs during this time. So fruits and vegetables are certainly important, but if we fill up on them too much during pregnancy, then we might not meet some of those other needs. And we'll talk about those in a, a little bit here. And then supplements, of course, are no longer kind of an optional uh, part of the diet. In pregnancy, there are supplements that are really important to take because needs are so high and um, we wanna make sure that we're meeting those. So we'll talk about that a little bit more as well. And then another question that often comes up is, you know, do you really have to eat for two? Is that a myth? How much should I be eating during pregnancy? So let's talk about that for a minute. Um, while you aren't necessarily eating for two, so you're not doubling your intake necessarily, you do have to eat more. And this is especially important for plant-based moms since plant-based foods tend to be pretty low in calories, um, but they're very filling. Uh, so during pregnancy, when your needs go up quite a bit, and then you also have this little uh, person crowding your stomach space, uh, you really do have to make sure that you're eating enough. So these are the kind of the recommendations in the first trimester. There actually is no increase in calorie needs. Uh, second trimester, it's about 340 additional calories a day. And then the third trimester, about 450 additional calories per day. And the key here to these added calories is that they are nutrient dense. So this isn't just, uh, you know, permission to eat ice cream and whatever else. This is you know, really important to eat nutrient dense foods because calories don't really go up that much compared to a lot of the nutrient increases. Well, some nutrient increases go up by as much as 50%, which we'll uh, look at. So these need to be really nutrient packed additional calories. So just to give you an idea of what this might look like during the second trimester, you know, we're really just looking at adding a substantial snack or bumping up serving sizes at main meals. So maybe that's um, you know hummus and whole grain crackers and carrot sticks or a fruit and nut bar and an apple or whole grain toast with peanut butter, something like that added to the diet. And then during the third trimester when calories go up a little bit more, we're looking at adding essentially another meal to the day or a few extra snacks to make sure that we're meeting our needs there. So it could be a bowl of oatmeal, it could be a stir fry, it could be a smoothie, um, but kind of bulking that up a little bit more. So now we're gonna look at those nutrient uh, changes. And I mentioned that some of them go up quite a bit. So the um, green squares show where nutrients go up, the requirements go up during pregnancy compared to um, non-pregnant times. So um, we'll touch on each of these now briefly and kind of why they're important during pregnancy and how to make sure that you get enough on a plant-based diet. And we'll start with protein. So this is one that in kind of general plant-based nutrition, we often say, don't worry about it as much as everyone wants you to worry about it. Um, but during pregnancy, needs actually increase by 50%. So we do need to think about it in pregnancy. And that comes out to roughly like 25 grams per day of extra protein. So plant-based proteins actually have an advantage uh, compared to animal proteins. So higher maternal animal protein intake is associated with children who are more likely to be classified as overweight 20 years later in their life and higher risk of gestational diabetes. So those plant-based sources can be really beneficial in pregnancy. So how do we meet our needs? First is to just make sure you're including plant-based sources at every meal. So making sure every meal has beans, lentils, soy, um, nuts and seeds, some kind of concentrated plant-based protein source. Choosing protein-rich plant-based milk, so choosing a soy milk, if you're normally an almond milk drinker or you use almond milk in your oatmeal, um, then choose soy milk. 
so that you can get that little protein boost. And then adding nuts and seeds to smoothies or grain bowls or oatmeal. So again, we're just thinking about plant-based nutrition a little bit differently in pregnancy to make sure we're meeting those unique needs. Um, and then one other thing that I, I like to talk about with protein is sometimes we hear about meat cravings in pregnancy and, oh, it's probably because, you know, you need more iron or you need more protein. Um, but that hasn't really shaken out in the research. So cravings are usually emotional. They're not necessarily targeted at a specific nutrient, or it just means that you're not eating enough overall. So um, I wouldn't let that derail you if you've heard that or you've experienced that doesn't necessarily mean you need to start eating meat. And then omega-3 essential fatty acids are, is one that we talk about in plant-based nutrition quite a bit, and it's really important during pregnancy because of its role in infant development, especially the DHA form. So there are three forms of omega-3s that we're concerned with, ALA, EPA, and DHA. Our ALA is found in plant-based foods, and it can technically be converted to DHA and EPA, meaning you can eat those plant-based sources of omega-3 fats and your body will convert them to the other types. But there's a really important piece of information to consider during pregnancy. So simply eating ALA does not increase DHA levels in blood or breast milk. So in other words, the baby can't seem to access mom's converted DHA. So because of that, a direct source of DHA is needed. So we can get that from a microalgae-based supplement. So there isn't a set recommendation for how much DHA you should take, but most experts recommend a minimum of 200 milligrams per day during pregnancy uh, to meet those needs. So again, ALA found in those plant-based foods, so flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, walnuts, making sure that you're eating at least a serving of those every day. But then to make sure that you're also taking that microalgae-based DHA supplement along with it. And let's talk about fish for a moment because that comes up when we talk about omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so should pregnant women eat fish? Now, on one hand, regularly eating fish is recommended by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists for pregnant women, mainly because of that omega-3 content. However, eating fish isn't without its risks. So first of all, fish are subject to contaminants found in our ocean today, namely mercury and heavy metals. And those can be really dangerous to be exposed to, especially during pregnancy. And then there are of course other environmental and ethical considerations like overfishing. So if everyone in the world followed fish recommendations, there actually wouldn't be enough fish in the sea for us to eat. Um, so these risks can easily be avoided by just taking that microalgae DHA supplement and fish get their microalgae or their DHA from microalgae. So we can just kind of cut out the fish and get ours from micro microalgae algae also. And then folate is a very important nutrient, especially in the early days of pregnancy, because it helps with neural tube development in the baby. So in the first few weeks of pregnancy, uh, this one is really important. And the good news is that plant-based eaters tend to have much higher folate consumption than omnivores because a lot of plant-based foods, leafy greens, beans, are really rich sources of folate. So although you should continue to eat those foods during pregnancy, lots of leafy greens, lots of beans, because this nutrient is so critical, it's also recommended to include a supplement. And every, pretty much every prenatal vitamin will contain folate. So, you know, the recommendation is to take a prenatal vitamin during pregnancy. So you'll get your folate that way, plus from the foods. And then blood volume drastically increases in pregnancy. So iron needs also increase by more than 50%. And maybe you've heard that people who eat plant-based diets need more iron than people who don't. And the Institute of Medicine does say that vegetarians may need to eat almost double the amount of recommended iron, which in pregnancy would come out to about 48 milligrams a day, which is like 12 cups of cooked lentils a day. Uh, that's a lot of lentils. <laughs> Um, but the good news is this recommendation is based on kind of a worst case scenario. So it's based on diets that contain very few things that help enhance iron absorption from plant-based foods 
and lots of things that block absorption from plant-based foods. So it's very unlikely that you actually need that much. So kind of the bottom line with iron is to eat iron rich plant-based foods at every meal. We'll look at those on the next slide and pair them with vitamin C rich foods because that really enhances the absorption. And then to avoid things that might inhibit plant-based iron absorption. So tea and coffee, for example, if you have those during meals, it can kind of block some of the iron absorption from that meal. So have them in between meals instead, have your coffee or tea after your meal. And then cooking with cast iron cookware can actually really enhance the iron content of the food that you're cooking, which is really cool. And that pairing iron rich and vitamin C rich foods can kind of sound like a lot of work or like it's complicated, but it's actually pretty natural. We kind of do it naturally. So for example, if you put almonds and strawberries in your oatmeal, then you've made that combination or tofu and broccoli in a stir fry or lentils and tomatoes in a soup, you've combined iron and, and vitamin C. So um, it's not as complicated as it might sound. And then zinc, we'll just talk about this one really briefly because needs do increase during pregnancy and um, people who eat plant-based diets might need to eat a little bit more than what kind of the general recommendation is here. So you just wanna make sure that you're including those zinc rich foods daily that you see here. And then most prenatal vitamins do contain zinc. Uh, so you'll kind of cover your bases that way. And then iodine is a really important one during pregnancy because even mild inadequacies of iodine can actually impa impact child cognitive performance later in life. So we really wanna make sure we're meeting needs for this one. And needs go up from 150 micrograms a day to 220 in pregnancy. Um, you've probably heard of seaweed being a good source of iodine, and certainly you can eat seaweed during pregnancy, but it's actually not recommended to rely on seaweed as kind of your sole source of iodine during pregnancy, just because the amounts can vary so much from different types, um, depending on where they came from. So again, with this one, most prenatals include iodine. So you just want to check your prenatal vitamin and make sure that it has some iodine in there and that you're getting enough that way. And then calcium needs actually don't change, but that's because the human body is incredible and becomes more efficient at absorbing calcium from your food during pregnancy. So it's still important to make sure pregnant people are getting enough calcium because the body will start to pull from mom's stores uh, to give baby everything they need. So you really want to make sure that your diet is adequate in calcium. So how do you do that? So we're really looking at about eight kind of mini servings of calcium rich foods every day. And the reason why we're doing mini servings is because our body can only absorb so much calcium at a time. So we want to kind of spread that intake out throughout the day. Again, this one might sound complicated or like it's a lot of work, but, uh, but you're doing it naturally if you're eating a balanced plant-based diet. So this might be half a cup of calcium rich veggies or greens, uh, half a glass of soy milk with your oatmeal that's fortified with calcium, a uh, fourth a cup of nuts or dried fruit, two tablespoons of a nut or seed butter. Uh, those will all be part of your meals anyway so you can get calcium that way. And then vitamin D needs also don't increase, but vitamin D is critical to baby's bone formation and vitamin D deficiencies are really common. So the first thing to do uh, when you find out you're pregnant is to get your vitamin D levels tested to see kind of what your status is and then kind of supplement accordingly because not many foods contain vitamin D. Um, the best way to get vitamin D is from the sun. So if, of course, during pregnancy, if you're able to get outside for 10 to 20 minutes for sun exposure in the afternoon, that's great. A lot of prenatal vitamins will contain some amount of vitamin D and then kind of based on what your levels are, maybe you need to top that off with an extra vitamin D supplement. And then B12, of course, is a topic of conversation when we talk about plant-based nutrition. 
and needs do increase slightly in pregnancy. Um, and getting enough is associated with reduced risk of neural tube defects. So important to get enough before you're pregnant, but also definitely during pregnancy as well. And certain foods are fortified with vitamin B12, and some people do rely on fortified foods to meet their needs. Um, but supplementation is really the most reliable method for meeting needs. And in pregnancy, so we do, our body does have a small storage capacity for B12. Uh, and that's why you've probably seen, or maybe you take a weekly B12 supplement instead of a daily one, because you're really just topping off those stores every week. Um, but there is some evidence that mom's stored B12 is not readily available to the baby. So during pregnancy, I usually recommend that people switch to a daily B12 supplement just to make sure that mom's getting everything she needs and the baby is able to access everything they need as well. So you wanna aim for at least 25 micrograms a day, probably more if you're 100% plant-based um, to make sure that you're getting enough. And then our last nutrient that we'll talk about is choline. And this is kind of a new kid on the block in pregnancy nutrition. Uh, needs increase just a little bit during pregnancy, but choline is proving to be very important for early brain development and reducing the risk of neural tube defects. So adequate intakes during pregnancy is actually associated with higher memory and morning scores in childhood later. So again, everything we're doing during pregnancy is really setting up kind of the next generation for being healthier. And most pregnant women in the United States, no matter what they eat, don't meet choline needs. And then kind of in addition to that, plant-based diets tend to be just a little bit lower in choline. So this is one that we wanna just pay a little bit of special attention to. So first thing we wanna do is emphasize choline rich foods uh, every day. So soy, soy milk, red potatoes, shiitake mushrooms, kidney beans, quinoa, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, all of those are high in choline. And then for people who are completely plant-based or if you don't eat a lot of those foods, then it might be a good idea to add a choline supplement and they make vegan choline supplements. Um, that are safe and effective uh, of about half of your needs uh, every day, just to kind of make sure that, that you're getting enough. So here's a look at kind of my prenatal vitamin and mineral checklist. And this is kind of what you're looking for when you're looking for a prenatal vitamin. So it's recommended that all pregnant people take a prenatal vitamin throughout pregnancy, kind of no matter what you're eating. And they're connected with good outcomes for pregnancy, for birth, and also for um, baby later in life as well. And um, then there's a couple other supplement or supplements here that you might consider adding. So maybe that DHA supplement and that um, extra choline as well. And prenatal vitamins are like every other supplement where they all differ and they all have different amounts. So you really want to turn that label over and take a look at uh, what's in it. Um, so we've talked a lot about supplements today, and while I certainly believe that food first is the best approach kind of generally um, to meet our nutrient needs, pregnancy is such an intense time of growth and development, both for mom's body and for the baby. So this is a time when we don't shy away from supplements, and these aren't things that you have to take forever, um, but it really is important during those nine months to make sure that you're meeting your needs. So kind of the first step is to go back to that plate and make sure that you're, you know, getting enough from all of those different food groups and then layering in the supplement as needed to top things off. And then just a quick look at some things not to eat during pregnancy. And the good news is that if you are plant-based, then you're already avoiding some of the most riskiest foods that we see on kind of the don't list during pregnancy. So things like undercooked animal foods and unpasteurized dairy, deli meats, those things have high, um, high rates of foodborne illness that can be really dangerous, especially in pregnancy. So of course we wanna avoid those. High mercury fish, we talked about that. That's a contaminant that can be really dangerous in pregnancy. Um, alcohol, there's controversy about alcohol in kind of general nutrition and also in pregnancy nutrition. But, you know, I tend to view alcohol as something that's not part of a healthy diet. It's not 
um, something that's necessary. So it should probably be avoided during pregnancy as well. And then unpasteurized juices or really unpasteurized anything should be avoided as well, again, because of the foodborne illness. And then exercising some caution with herbs and teas and adaptogens. So if you go to a coffee shop, you probably see, you know, reishi mushroom lattes and different things like that. Um, you want to be really careful about you know, what you're consuming during pregnancy because some things can be supportive, but some things can be pretty dangerous. So if you want to dig into this information further, I have a, tons of free resources at plantbasedmavens.com. So you can get a prenatal supplement guide that includes a lot of what we talked about today. It includes some vegan friendly brands that I tend to recommend for prenatal vitamins. Um, that's all free. You can get a copy of that meal blueprint uh, that I showed you as well, if that's a helpful resource. And then there's a pregnancy checklist that's kind of a lifestyle medicine checklist for things to start doing and make sure that you're doing um, when you find out that you're pregnant. And then of course, if you're not pregnant, <laughs> I have lots of resources for you as well. So a general plant-based supplement guide um, with brand recommendations, seven day meal plan, um, with recipes and, and lots of other things as well. And then if you wanna dig in even deeper, I have a course available as well, um, Plant-Based Basics for Women. So if you're looking for plant-based nutrition information that's specifically for women's health, um, this is a great resource. So it's kind of all the tools and information that I share with uh, private clients. So it's kind of like meeting with me one-on-one, -on -one, but you don't have to invest in that service. Um, so it's a, a great resource. So thank you so much. And I hope that you'll come visit me um, at my website and then at Plant Based Mavens over on Instagram as well. And I hope you're all convinced that you can um, be really confident with staying uh, on your plant-based diet throughout pregnancy. Oh. Wow, What? Oh, there's some great information there. I took some notes and I have a few questions if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, first of all, I agree with you that alcohol is not a health food, but let's just say <laughs> for argument's sake that it is. Why would it be necessary you know, during pregnancy? Because you said that taste buds are, are developed in utero. So why would you want to make the baby like alcohol? Yeah, I don't know. I think, you know, the people that, uh, that tend to want to consume alcohol or are more curious about that, it's more for the mom. Like she wants to have her glass of wine after dinner or, um, whatever routine she might've had pre-pregnancy. Um, so yeah, yeah, there is some controversy on it, but most of the recommendation is to avoid it because I, yeah, it's, I, I think of alcohol as a toxin really, um, to the body. So why would you want to introduce that during pregnancy when there's unknowns? Absolutely. Or anytime, but especially <laughs> during pregnancy, but that blows right. my mind that the taste buds are developed in utero. So, so know. Many, you know, there are people that like get pregnant without knowing it, They're, like maybe accidentally mm -hmm. or trying to get pregnant. And so if you know that you're trying to get pregnant, wouldn't it be best, Kaylee, to, you know, move your diet in a healthier direction even before you conceive? Because of course, if you're surprised by your pregnancy, you're, you know, you, you got to do the best you can, but it seems right. like somebody should plan to do this and not just wait until they get that positive pregnancy test and say, okay, now I'm going to eat healthy. Exactly. Yes. I usually, if people come to me and they're planning a pregnancy and they have some time, then I usually recommend, you know, three good months of really changing their lifestyle and changing their eating habits. Right. Because it's hard for people, especially if people eating the standard American diet or even a junk food version of the vegan diet, you know, it, it takes time, it takes time for their taste buds to adjust, you know? So right. the worst time to do it is like, Oh, I'm pregnant now. Now I better eat some kale. No, eat it before <laughs> you get pregnant. Exactly. And the first trimester is usually the hardest with morning sickness and all those things. So it's better to set those, those habits up early than to try to do it. Uh, in those first few months. You know, I thought it was so interesting when you talked about like uh, the caloric needs that were needed in different trimesters and they're not as great as people would think yet so many people gain, I've heard people gaining, you know, 70 pounds with a pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And everyone will kind of gain weight differently and, and that's okay. Some people will look pregnant in the first few months and some people it will take longer than that. And that's totally, you know, okay and individual, but you're right that needs aren't quite as high as you think they are, but those nutrient needs go up so much 
um, that we really need to make sure that those extra calories are coming from really healthy foods. Well, I think that's one of the coolest things about a plant-based diet is the foods that are highest in nutrient density tend to be the foods lowest in calorie density. So people, even if they're pregnant, they don't have to you know, count calories or weigh and measure their food. Right, exactly. Yep. Would you, let's just say hypothetically that somebody uh, is pregnant and they want to lose weight or need to lose weight. Would that not be the best time for them to go on a reducing plan? Yeah, it's not recommended to lose weight during pregnancy. Um, weight gain is a natural, healthy part of the process. Um, so it's really about kind of focusing on lifestyle factors and, you know, changing what you're eating and, you know, changing some other habits in your life, maybe starting physical activity, all of that is safe to do during pregnancy. Um, so that's really where I would put the focus. Mm-hmm. You know, I thought that was interesting. You quoted a study that if, a, if the mother eats a lot of animal protein, that it can affect the child like 20 years later. How do they even think to study something like that? That's interesting. I know. Isn't that cool? Yeah. I mean, there's lots of kind of through epigenetics and looking at, you know, what mom did during pregnancy, before pregnancy, and then what happens later in life, you know, you can find a lot of associations yeah. there. And in general, a plant-based diet and all of those lifestyle medicine factors that we talk about, all of those are correlated with healthy pregnancy and healthy baby, and then a healthy adult later in life. Does the father's diet make a difference? Because I would imagine it's very difficult for a mother to eat healthily if the father's just eating junk food, but does it make <laughs> a difference to the fetus? I know it makes a difference to the environment of a child grows up in when there's a conflict at home, but in, in terms of conceiving, does the father's diet matter at all? Yes, absolutely. And it can be as much as 50% of the, of the load is carried by the father. So Um, We often kind of unfairly focus on women and, you know, the changes that they need to make, but, you know, eating red meat and all of these, those different things that we see correlated in women with unhealthy, you know, infertility or unhealthy pregnancy, um, it's the same is true for dad. So if he's eating junk food, but mom is, you know, doing everything she can, that's probably not, not the best situation. Um, to conceive and have a successful pregnancy, but then also during pregnancy, you know, it's already hard enough to go through all the changes that you're going through. Um, So having that support, having someone else in the house who's eating that way and living that kind of lifestyle can be really helpful. Yeah. And more supportive is is key, I think. You know, you mentioned to increase protein, a good choice might be to have like soy milk over oat milk. There are some people out there that actually do have a soy allergy. So is there another product you might recommend? Yeah, hemp milk would be another option. Um, And it doesn't have to be, you don't have to rely on a milk to get your protein. That's just one kind of strategy that you can uh, use to increase your needs. So if you're not doing soy, that's totally fine. You can get your protein from beans and lentils and from things like hemp seeds and, and nuts and seeds as well. Because yeah. one one of the viewers named Jackie wrote in a question in advance specifically for you. She was saying she's new to plant-based cooking and noticed that so many recipes use tamari or soy sauce. What could be used in place that is soy-free? But I would also add to that, does the amount of sodium a pregnant woman uh, ingests, is, is that important? Like, should she be worried about how much salt she's eating? Yeah, yeah. So we saw in those statistics that most pregnant women are exceeding sodium recommendations by, I think it was 88%. Um, So they're getting quite a bit more sodium. Um, And you can eat sodium more liberally during pregnancy because the blood volume is increasing. But you do want to be careful with that because, um, you know, Things like preeclampsia can be connected with uh, eating too much sodium. So that is definitely something to pay attention to. What causes cravings? And have you had any unusual cravings during your (laughs) first eight and a half months? Yeah, you know, like I mentioned, people kind of say, oh, the cravings must mean that, you know, you need to start eating meat or whatever it is that you're craving. Um, But cravings are, the research doesn't really show that. Uh, cravings are mostly emotional. So when we're craving things, it's mostly emotional, or it's a sign that maybe we're not eating enough. Um, so it's a bit of a nuanced thing, because I do believe in kind of listening to your body. Um, so for example, in the first trimester, you know, I wanted a lot of like sour things um, that really sounded good to me, fruit sounded good to me. 
Um, and then like pretty plain, like whole wheat toast with nothing on it. <laughs> That's like pretty much what I could eat um, because of the morning sickness and nausea and that sort of thing. Um, so you do have to kind of listen to your body as much as you can, but then when something, you know, when you're able to eat something like a smoothie, that's a great way in the first trimester, especially to just pack it with a bunch of, um, you know, healthy things and get that in, in the first trimester. Sometimes that goes down a little bit easier. Um, but since then I've been eating exactly how I always eat. I've been eating all the plant-based foods, um, and I haven't had any weird, weird cravings or anything that's kind of like derailed me. What causes the nausea? And if some, I mean, it does make it very hard for people to eat when they're experiencing nausea. Yes, it, it really is. And it's really caused by all the hormonal changes that are happening during that time. Um, you're having a huge increase in hormones and that's kind of what's causing that. And so really you just have to do the best you can through that period of time. That's why that prenatal vitamin is really important. It's kind of your backup strategy and finding simple things that you can eat that that taste good. And then I found that um, ginger was really helpful for me and mint was really helpful. So I would make ginger tea or mint tea and that would help with the nausea as well. What about exercise during pregnancy? And does it depend if the person has, I mean, like you don't want to like just start training for a marathon the minute you find out you have conceived, I would imagine. Yes, that's probably not a good idea, but it is safe to exercise throughout pregnancy. There are certain changes like your, um, because of the hormones, your joints start to loosen a little bit and certain positions like lying on your back that aren't as safe during pregnancy. So it's a good idea to get familiar with what's safe and what's not safe during that time. Um, but you can continue to exercise if you were exercising previously. If you were not exercising and you wanna start exercising, that's okay too, you can start doing that. So. Of course, you want to start slowly, maybe walking, yoga, things like that, and build up. Um, but it is safe and really beneficial to exercise throughout pregnancy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, do, uh, do you know if you're having a boy or a girl, or you, or you don't want to know? We are having a boy. Oh, wow. Well, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, well, they, you know, back in the day, baby showers, they would guess what it was based on where a woman was showing. You know, high uh -huh. or taller. Did that correlate uh, with you? Uh, it, it didn't. I forget what which way it is. I think it's lower if you're having a boy. Um, and I was pretty high. So uh, I've been pretty high, carrying pretty high. So that did not correlate. You know, you're not able to see patients right now. So what advice do you have for people that have pushback from either if they're seeing a registered dietitian or even their obstetrician or their pediatrician once the baby is born, you know, saying, oh, you have to, you know, feed the baby milk, you know, meaning, meaning cow's milk, not breast milk. Sure. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that pressure during pregnancy and then also for, you know, for babies and small children to include those foods. You know, I would go, I would go to resources that you can share with your provider. So like the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics position statement, which I shared a quote from, and I'm happy to send the link uh, to include in the show notes for that. Um, but it clearly states that uh, plant-based diets are healthy for all stages of the life cycle. So that includes infants, that includes children, pregnant women, breastfeeding women, um, and then they have tons of resources on kind of, you know, why the benefits and, and how to do it in a healthy way. So I think sharing those reputable resources with a provider can be a helpful place to start. You know, it's, it's amazing that we still have to like, I don't know if the word is fight for that, but like prove that it should be, they should prove that their meat eating standard of care <laughs> processed food diet is healthy for a baby. Because, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, why do we have yeah. to defend what we know is a healthy diet for all stages when they're just allowed to eat whatever they want? Right. Yes, it is unfortunate. Yeah. And then, oh, and, you know, with feeding the baby, it, I, I I think about this all the time because I, I was somebody that was obese from the time I was five and had such mm -hmm. bad sugar addictions. And and now I, when I go to Costco, where, you know, they have great organic greens and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, they have these great deals. I think it's like a dollar or a dollar 50, you get a hot dog and a, a soda with a, a free refills. And so what I see, and it's like, I don't, 
I mean, the people that I need to reach are not going to be watching this, but they take their, their soda. I don't know what kind, whatever flavor, mm-hmm. Coke or whatever. And then I see them pouring it in a sippy cup and then filling it up for themselves. And I mean, like, like these kids, they don't even look like they're two years old. And it's, right. It's like, you know, if, if you if you give your kids like cigarettes or cocaine, the child protective services will take them away, but people feed their kids. And I'm not talking about when they get older and they're, you know, at school and mm-hmm. they're curious, but, you know, when, sure. when they're not even basically talking or walking, you kind of have control over their diet at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And like starting at pregnancy and going through, you know, infancy and childhood, those times when you have more control over what your child is exposed to, that's a really great time to establish those habits because, um, you know, they could stick long-term and really affect their health long-term. So a, a lot of women gain weight as they should, but sometimes they, maybe they gain more than they want or their body shape has changed and, you know, they want to now start a reducing plan. What advice do you give them when they want to get rid of their baby weight, if you will? Yeah. Well, first I like to just kind of set the expectation that you're never going to be the same as you were before. And that's okay. You've gone through something really transformative. um, And so your body has changed a lot. And so you don't need to kind of labor yourself with that or burden yourself with that expectation that you're going to go back to the way you were exactly. Um, But you can start to introduce all of those healthy habits. And if you start them preconceptually or in pregnancy, you know, as early as you can start them, they're going to get easier uh, postpartum. So starting slowly with introducing exercise as you've been cleared to do so and kind of, I think especially during that postpartum time when it's, there's still a lot of hormonal changes and lack of sleep, it's helpful to kind of reframe those habits as a form of self-care. So you're exercising to kind of boost your energy because you're not sleeping as much as you would like to um, and kind of seeing the benefits that way. And then again, you know, following all of those plant-based nutrition principles that we talk about and introducing those really nutrient dense, low calorie foods is a great way um, to start to, to start to kind of get back to a place that feels comfortable. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that you'll, I'm sure you're going to gain even more experience working with people having, once you have the child, help them feed the child, because I always hear them say, well, my kid won't eat healthy. And you know why? Because they're not eating healthy. <laughs> yep. Yep. You are your, you know, you are your child's role model in those early months and years. So it's very important to lead by example. That's for sure. Yeah. Would you mind, since I didn't know what you were going to exactly talk about pregnancy, somebody did take the time to write a question in an advance because you are a plant-based registered dietitian. It's not, sure. pregnancy, but would you mind taking a stab? Thank you. It's from Amanda. And she said, after an organic acid test through a urine sample, I learned that I am very low in vitamin C and very high in oxalates. A past colonoscopy showed inflammation in my ileum, which is where many nutrients are absorbed. Do you have any recommendations for how to get the vitamin C I eat daily to absorb better and how to reduce my oxalate levels without cutting out most of what I eat as a vegan? Mm, that's a tricky one. Uh, first, first, I would be curious who did the urine test and what kind of urine test it was, because I know there's a lot of nutrition testing out there um, that is done by kind of functional medicine folks that isn't exactly backed by research. So we want to be careful about um, some of those, you know, food sensitivity tests and things like that and make sure that they're evidence-based. And then as far as kind of lowering oxalates, you know, when we think about certain foods like greens that are high in oxalates, not all of them are. So maybe staying away from the um, beet greens, the the spinach, those ones that are higher in oxalates and trying to stick more to kale and romaine and things that are lower in oxalates might be helpful. Um, That's, yeah, that's, that's what I would recommend for that. That's a complicated one. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure there's, like you said, you were going to send me a resource for people to see other uh, plant-based dietitians, right? It just froze for a sec. What the heck is going on? I think it's because we're having so many rains here. Well, I'm glad it didn't happen during our PowerPoint, guys. I'm so sorry. Uh, What do we do? 
Let's see. Well, I don't know if she sees me because I feel like I'm not frozen because I'm moving. Darn, I may have to end it because that was the last. God, I, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know. I didn't feel like I froze. I felt like you froze, but you're back. Thank goodness. Yes. If the course came to worse, I was going to say goodbye to the audience because that was the last question. But now that I have you back, so I know you're probably going to be taking some time off to have the baby, but it, uh, people can still take your course. We'll have all the links. So do you have a social media presence or is there a particular place we should send people that want to know more about you or follow you? Yep. Plantbasedmavens.com. Lots of free information there and plantbasedmavens.com backslash favorites. Uh, and I'll provide that link as well as where all that free stuff, uh, free downloads um, exist. And then my course and then um, Instagram, it's plantbasedmavens. So I will be there. Well, thank you so much, Kaylee. This was wonderful. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Maybe you'll come back after you have the baby. <laughs> yes, I would love to. That would be great. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in one hour when we have another wonderful plant-based expert, Dr. Scott Harrington for Vegan Doc Talk. Take care.